Okay. Um, welcome to this session on um, really, I guess the best way to summarize it is um, preservation of born digital material in the large. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work, as you know, going on on the sort of mechanics of how you preserve particular classes of digital objects, um, be they websites, be they um, electronic books, uh, you name it, um, digital art. Uh, and that's not what we're going to talk about here. What we're going to talk about here is how we think about a whole sort of emerging ecology and economy of digital artifacts of various kinds, and how we think about those as comprising an important part of the cultural record and the scholarly record. Um, we see those, or at least I see those, as a really important um, record, not just of scholarship, but of the raw material we're going to need to do future scholarship. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're going to talk about here. I should have introduced myself. I'm Cliff Lynch, uh, but you can see I'm really focused on this topic. This is my colleague um, and friend, Carol Mandel, um, Dean Emerita of New York University and now a clear presidential fellow. Um, how did we get here? So I have been looking at the kind of dual problems of the changing economy um, as material moves digital and the emergence of a whole pile of new genres of digital objects um, uh, from web pages to ebooks to you name it. Um, and I've, I've been tracking this since about, uh, oh, heaven help us, the turn of this last century. Um, uh, it's really been that long now. Um, I've seen a lot of things happen. I've seen, for example, um, how we actually, in some ways, did pretty good with journals as they made the transition from digital to electronic, building systems like locks and portico to ensure their persistence. Um, there are interesting stories to be extracted there, one of which is that that is an area where the authors, the publishers and transmitters, and the marketplace all shared a common value that lasting preservation was important and worked together to figure out how to make it happen, um, which does not characterize many other domains uh, here. Um, I saw the development of things like the Keeper's Registry, which Peter Burnhill and his colleagues um, updated us on earlier, which actually is a sort of a first um, heroic attempt to answer the question, at least for journals, well, how well are we doing? Are we doing any better than we did last year? Is this a disaster, or should we feel relatively good, although there's room to do better? Uh, one of the things I've learned in looking at other areas is that even for what I'd characterize as pretty mainstream um, uh, you know, commercial cultural content, think, some, think of something like e-books, um, we have no idea. We know, I, I, can, I can guarantee you with high certainty we're doing extremely badly. But if you ask me to put a quantitative number on it year over year, I can't. Uh, we can't even begin to. Um, we have some really, really bad approximations, which we can talk about. But um, these are the kinds of large-scale things that have been keeping me up at night for the last 20 years on and off. And um, you know, I've actually got sort of a half, half the, the very beginnings of a manuscript that has been languishing since around 2017 because I can't seem to find any time to work on it. And then I got this email from Carol Mandel who's sort of in the mode of, well, I just finished being dean. I now have the luxury of time to really think deeply about 
these problems I'm really interested in, and I'd really like to chat with you about it. And so we had several of these like amazing lengthy chats and realized that we were very much on the same wavelength, except that she's actually produced a um, concise and coherent account of at least a sizable subset of the problems I've been agonizing about, put it out in a clear report that came out around, um, what, September or thereabouts, um, uh, which is available on the web. And I think I put the coordinates for that out to CNI announce, and then boiled it down to a very concise slide presentation of some of the highlights and questions. Um, what we're going to do today is, um, now that I've finished these kind of framing remarks, is we're going to run through that and conclude with a, couple, a set of questions that um, we, I hope we can talk about. Um, I'll make a few additional remarks um, after she goes through the presentation and frames the questions. And um, then we're going to open it up to discussion. And I am very hopeful that we'll have at least like 20, 25 minutes for conversation. And I'm really very interested, and I know Carol is really very interested in um, hearing what uh, some of you are thinking about these issues. Over to you, Carol. Thanks so, thanks so much, Cliff. And if uh, for those of you um, who've seen this presentation at DLF, it is this. It is mostly the same one. Um, but the point here is th the reason I've done this framing and this article, which is really intended to be just the first chapter of what goes on to really look at how can we dig into different types of material and address this, um, is is to get conversation going, and you'll see why that's so important uh, as we talk about this. Um, and uh, so what started out, I thought this was just going to be a very short introduction um, to work that was going to continue. And the more I dig into, dug into it, the more I saw the depth of the situation and the issues, which is, you know, that's the work that Cliff has been doing and trying to do. It's just it, you realize how huge uh, this is. And so um, it turned into the, um, the piece that's now published as a clear report. But that is still just a frame. <laughs> and, and we have a lot more work to do. Um, so uh, I'm really uh, honored uh, to be here today with Clifford. And I'm excited to be here with uh, so many creative um, talented professionals um, and to help us to dig into this. Um, you know, uh, and Clifford's talking about the fact that we've worked working on this since the turn of the century, essentially. Uh, and and um, I was privileged to serve on that the task force that Don Waters so brilliantly led in the 90s, yes, um, that on archiving digital information when we were just beginning to imagine what that meant and what this world was going to be. And um, quite a landmark um, effort. And um, since then, uh, we've really seen what's the equivalent of a generation of accomplishment in, in this arena. Um, and and I, I really saw it um, at the presentation just a little earlier this afternoon of folks from um, different digital preservation projects. You know, 20 years ago, the field didn't even exist. And then here were all these just wonderful professionals developing the standards and the tools and the activities that we need, and they keep doing it. So a, just a lot has been accomplished. And Cliff alluded to you know, portico and locks and the new kinds of um, uh, constructs that we needed to go forward. The, um, there's continuing research and development, and there's some pretty significant um, born digital collections um, in national libraries, and you know there's you know Internet Archive, and so there's all this just terrific um, work uh, going on. So how come you know where where I'm up, Cliff is up in the middle of the night worrying about this, um, and and that is because for all of this. When you look at 
the nature and scale of how our world is now documented and expressed, um, how knowledge is conveyed, how cultural heritage is conveyed, the, the, the scale and nature of born digital content is quite extraordinary. And there's still a lot of holes um, in, in what the future is going to know about this. Um, so, um, think, so that's, that's, that, that nightmare, the picture on this screen, um, is what kind of led me to think, well, you know, now I've got a little time to think about this. Um, what, what might we um, start to do about it? And of course, you know, we can't save everything. Um, we can talk later about how many cat videos are enough. Um, there's, you know, I, I mean, there, a case could be made for saving everything in that then you have the picture of everything and you have technologies to mine it. But I'm not up here to advocate for saving everything. So if you want to poo-poo what I'm saying for that reason, no, that's not what I'm about. But the holes of what we have are just huge. Just think about um, from streaming, from streaming broadcast news to, I mean, news. What could be more important and basic for you know future knowledge of what happened? Um, to creative production, to cultural heritage. There are just huge gaps right now, if we stay as we are, about what the future will know about us. And so I've been trying to figure out, wh why are we in this state? Um, we have such great memory institutions. Um, why is born digital collecting? And that's what I'm talking about. We've done all this great work in digitizing collections, making things available. We've done all this great collecting. I remember when it was a big deal to look at audio and video and not just print. Remember, Howard, when that, like, you know? Um, but so we've done some great things. But born digital has stumped us in a very different ways, and I want to talk about why I, why I think that is. And you know, the bottom line here is, if you're not collecting it, if you're not taking stewardship responsibility for it, then it's not going to be preserved, no matter how many wonderful technologies um, you have. And so I think it really um, gets down to that collecting and. And, and stewardship answer. And so that, that sounds like, oh, eureka, simple answer to this question. But it's really complex. We make assumptions about collecting and stewardship, but you look around in our whole, like last several hundred years of collecting and stewardship do not naturally translate into the digital age. That is why we're where we are. Um, so that, that task force um, uh, that I spoke about Don's, uh, under Don's leadership, I want to read this quote because, you know, that was back in 1996. And that report said, the, and when we barely had technologies for understanding how to preserve digital content, but the group said the problem of preserving digital information for the future is not only or even primarily a problem of fine-tuning a set of technical variables, although goodness knows it's hard to fine-tune that set of technical variables. Rather, it is a grander, I love that word, problem of organizing ourselves over time and as a society, as a society, to maneuver effectively in a digital landscape. And that is what I started to look at and think about as in the framing, and I realized that the problem was bigger and scarier than I started out to think about. So I spent some time, if you've read the paper, or if you have some time with nothing else to do uh, after this meeting and you want to take a look at it, I spent a lot of time looking at what I call the mosaic of memory, the memory institutions, the mosaic of different kinds of memory institutions that we have that have grown up in the past several hundred years. Some have an even longer background to create the fact that we have memory. And, you know, different definitions of different kinds of documents. <coughs> you know what? I'm going to grab this water. I've got this bottle right here. Um, you forget that as a speaker, these things will happen to you. 
And you'll notice in these mosaic tiles, you know, they're not all big research libraries. You know, there might be a picture of the Library of Congress here, but it's, it's, it's a combination of all these kinds of specialized collections and small collections and private collections that have grown up and come together. And they haven't come together in a particularly coordinated way, but there's a set of kind of societal understandings and expectations that puts this together. And so even though this mosaic isn't, doesn't have a premeditated uber picture to it, and you can't use that word anymore in quite the same way, can you? Um, <laughs> I wasn't talking about them. Um, but, but, but there has been a cohesive expectation of, of memory. But I started comparing this picture to what we're looking at in the digital age and where we really are in the, you know, um, almost the end of the second decade of the 21st century here, and looking at the realities of our 21st century memory institutions. Um, for one thing, even the libraries who, who have been charged with collecting are moving their emphasis from collecting to services. This is not a criticism, okay? I just, I am not up here to say I wish it were different. I'm just up here to say this is how it is, so like now what do we do? Um, and, and so even, and also of course libraries have focused largely on collecting published material and what's, you know, what is the born digital content that we're looking at? It's not the kind of stuff that was ever in their scope anyway. But they're, so they're, they're not focused on, well how do we then change our scope and, and expand it? They're focused on all the services that they are under pressure from their institutions to deliver because that's what their parents' institution wants. The, the towns that support public libraries, the universities that support university research libraries, they want to see those community services. That's what they're paying for. Um, we, we have a, a really complicated picture. The copyright deposit is a great way to catch, you know, at least national heritage imprints, but there's lots of holes in that net when it comes to e-deposit. It has it matched up. We, um, we don't really, the, the small um, specialized institutions, the local historical societies, the public libraries that used to at least make sure they got the high school yearbooks and the local hometown newspapers and um, what, we haven't really created an infrastructure for them to turn that kind of hyper-local collecting into born digital collecting. Um, and then, the, as I mentioned, the new forms of born digital content, such as social media, just, you know, don't match anyone's responsibility. Not published, not archival, what is it, Who's, whose is it? And so as institutions that are traditional memory institutions turn towards what they're working on, that's just kind of going by them. Um, I do want to note that one place where we have a kind of clearer line of responsibility, even though material is born digital, is in organizational archives. Um, I think that's one reason archivists have been at the forefront of dealing with things like email and new forms of digital content because they know that they need to collect their institution's archives. There are, however, lots of problems. They are, all, first off, they're struggling. They're doing a great job in many cases. But you also have situations where smaller organizations or professional architectural firms, um, you know, publishers whose records we always want, they are very interesting. Um, can't make, they don't hire full-time archivists, and at least they used to be able to hand over boxes of stuff to people, but now, it, now they don't have archivists on board. So even though the responsibility may be clear, the match of technology and expectation is just not uh, working there. So, um, as I said, um, you know, uh, we're, we're making assumptions about collecting, and it's not matching these organizations anymore. And as I said, we're not, I'm not out to criticize them, 
it's that they are up against challenges and mismatch that, that, don't, that don't work. We have really daunting elements of what I'm calling here digital disruption. There is the vast scale of documentary content. Whose responsibility is that? It's so much. How do you do it? I guess you can't talk with your hands when you're knocking microphones over. The speaking of unwieldy nature of these network forms, you know, streaming, interactive, computed, they're really hard um, and problematic. Um, the dispersed creation of content, you know, even traditional kinds of published material isn't going through publishers. Um, it's just going right to Amazon and we can talk about stories of, I know, one national library tried to get Amazon to encourage authors to deposit um, self-published work, and you know, Amazon's real interested in that, right? That's just what it's <laughs> out to do. Um, so um, let's, you know, let's talk about uh, personal records. I mean, the folks that are interested in supporting people in their personal digital archiving are heroic. It's wonderful. But we know that human nature is stuff such that uh, if this is hard to do, it's, it's just not going to happen. You know, how, how narcissistic do you have to be to spend all your time dealing with your own photographs of yourself? You know, people just don't, uh, don't do that. And then, again, no boxes of things to hand over later um, to your grandchildren. You know there are all kinds of intellectual property barriers. Those have been talked about a lot. They don't go away. Um, you've got to deal with the platform owners and the content owners. Privacy scares everyone to death. Um, it, it's, it really confines, it's, it's a valid concern. We're all usually on the side of, oh my God, you know, they're surveying us all the time. They know everything. But the other thing is, is the big tech is worried about letting anything out because they're under the gun on privacy. So then they don't share it uh, for us to be able to do research with it. Very tricky. Um, and then there's you know the ephemerality of the problem. Again, the boxes don't come down later. If you're not thinking about preserving it up front, where is it going to be? So these are just huge disruptive changes in the in the nature of what and how we've um, been collecting. So what that really turns into is that it is, I think, really by the definition of uh, systems designers and urban planners and uh, uh, you know, social problem solvers, it is a wicked societal problem. It's not just wicked because it's hard. Um, I won't go through all the characteristics of wicked problems, but it's a societal problem. It's not just for the traditional memory institutions to solve by themselves. We can't. They can't. We're not the same. We don't match it. It's a wicked societal problem. And we have to recognize it for that if we're going to begin talking about what should we do, as opposed to just waiting for some heroic memory institution to, to solve it all uh, for us. Um, we really need new strategies, new roles, new partnerships, new initiatives, and new collaborations. And we have to think about how to construct those, what should those be, what are the most promising things that we can do. I don't have a bunch of answers. I hope to do more work where, and you've got to take it format by format and problem by problem and try to figure it out. But the fact is we, we have to strategize these things in new ways. So that's why Cliff and I are here picking your brains today, because we need diverse, creative problem solving. Memory institutions need to take the lead in this because we're the ones that wake up caring about it, but we can't do it alone, and we have to figure out how to get help and what that help should be and how to attract help. And so we have to take a quite different um, approach. And that's why um, earlier on I highlighted you know, some of the wholly new approaches like Portico, Clocks, I think the Por Software Preservation Network and the work they're doing fits into that, and of course, Internet Archive, you know, um, just completely new bottles for new wine. That's what we need, and we need, but we're not done here. We just need so many more of um, these ideas. So um, there are so many, uh, and this is one of the areas we want to hear from you, kind of 
priorities because every one of these things that you see um, on these bullets, and this is only the beginning of a list, and I realized I should have added, you know, the newest kind of hot one is open source intelligence sources. If you got to, you know, all this open content that's out there that's being used right now to do investigative journalism, isn't that the same stuff you should be writing history with later or figuring out what society looked at later? So uh, each of these things needs different kinds of strategies, different kinds of partnerships, different ways of um, looking at it. And so what are your priorities? What, where do you want to go? Who, you know, how can we address this? We need to get a lot of energy around, around each of these things. Um, I just, I, I couldn't help, and I, I think it's also kind of a moment, you know, on, I, on the one hand, I, I don't expect much from Amazon, but it is true that big tech is under a certain amount of pressure right now um, for trying to look better, at least. Maybe it's a moment of getting their attention to find ways to do a little good in the world. I've also noticed, um, I put this, I just found this, uh, this cartoon. Can you read that from here, or I can read it to you? And here are those family photos you thought you had lost in the cloud, is the caption here. I was so happy to see that in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago because at least this problem is maybe coming to you know the consciousness um, of the general public. So, but it needs more than just consciousness. It needs proposed solutions that we can get people excited. And there won't be one solution. Wicked problems don't have solutions. They have mitigating strategies, and we need mitigating strategies that we can get around. So um, I've put up a set of uh, discussion questions here, um, and I'm going to turn it, I'm going to turn the hard part over to Cliff. <laughs> While you contemplate these um, discussion questions for a minute, um, let me just say a few things. Um, I think that there is a unfortunate tendency in this area to start with things that we think we understand and are easy. Um, and sometimes that's an appropriate thing to do. For example, I think it really was appropriate to do scholarly journals because for many of our institutions that really is sort of a core piece of record. And we understood, at least initially, the properties that those maintained as they did a fairly literal translation from paper to digital paper. Um, uh, we, we understood the properties there. Um, I think we want to question that strategy in other areas where just because we think we know what we're doing and maybe have a prayer of going forward doesn't mean that's the place to park huge resources. Priorities are really hard to figure out because you've got conflicting things that um, you may want to optimize. There's one argument that says, pick the things that are going to be most important in the future, the classes of things. There's another argument that says, pick the things that are most at risk. Those are the priorities. The things that are most at risk aren't necessarily going to be the most important. Um, another aspect of this, which I think makes us deeply uncomfortable, and we've been burned on in the past, but at the same time we have no choice pragmatically but to consider, is in what cases is content of various sorts that is owned by commercial interests of enough lasting value and the commercial interests seem to be stable enough that at least for the short to middle term future, we can say they will be well motivated and sufficiently resourced to take care of this material. And in what cases isn't that going to happen? We need to be very careful making those assumptions, of course, because one of the things we've learned in the um, transformation to uh, the digital world is that whole sectors of the economy can kind of collapse in very, very short order. 
a case in point being local journalism, um, which you know um, really was pretty healthy, and then it just suddenly collapsed. And local journalism had at least back in the print days a relatively good record of maintaining archives and morgues and working with local memory institutions to make sure that some record of that stuff was preserved. It wasn't perfect, but you know, you would have hoped that that would have turned out OK, and then it really, really, really didn't turn out OK. Um, at the same time, I'd like to believe, at least this morning, that um, you know, the big national newspapers, which are clearly very important um, uh, you know, sources for future scholars in any number of fields, uh, right now seem to be sufficiently well-funded and sufficiently motivated that they'll probably take reasonably good care of that collection of material. At least I'd like to believe that. Um, so we're going to need to wrestle with that sort of thing. I think that one of the things that we don't consider enough is we seem to feel like any area we need to go into to preserve, we need to do it comprehensively. And I'm not sure that's true. I think there are areas where we might wish we could do it comprehensively, but we can't for various reasons, lack of resource, lack of priority, lack of access. But we can do enough to preserve a sense of that material into the future. We can, we can project into the future some idea of what it was like to see that or participate in that or do that. And even that has very genuine value, I think, um, that we may need to be satisfied with in some cases. So here are some questions that are framed. Um, I think I'll just close my comments with one last uh, reflection. When we start thinking about commercial content, um, well, actually, this goes beyond commercial content, but it's most obvious with commercial content. We are in a world, or about to enter a world, depending on the specifics of the marketplace, where basically we cannot preserve, and indeed cannot share also in a library sense of sharing. Um, content without the explicit consent of the rights holder. Um, that is a absolutely radical departure from the world of physical objects. And it's very easy for the general public, for example, to not understand how profound that is. It feels to me like um, we need some kind of a strategy for a very large scale public understanding campaign about just how serious that shift is and about the need for not just, you know, sort of inside baseball legislative tinkering, but a genuine sort of public opinion and policy commitment that that's not where we want to be and that we need to get somewhere else. And I think that ties in also to what Carol was saying about perhaps we are entering a period of opportunity to get some players to do the right thing, not because they have to, but because they can win in the court of public opinion by doing the right thing, and we should be there to help them. That's going to require longer-term strategies and um, uh, activities that I think are pretty unfamiliar to our community, but that at least to me are feeling increasingly important and can, be, and I firmly believe can be made re reasonable and comprehensible to the broad public by drawing on their own experiences and their experiences in the world around them more. So with those reflections, um, let's talk about this list, and let's hear from some of you. Um, we do have a microphone. 